Hello everyone, I'm Alyosha de Millemeister, a senior graphics engineer at Unity. I'm leading the team working on graphics streaming and in this session I'll be covering the new streaming virtual texturing feature. So let's get started. In this session I'll discuss briefly Graphine, a middleware company. I'll discuss high resolution textures and what problems they might cause. Then we'll dive into what streaming virtual texturing is, when you can use it, and how you can use it, and then also what is on our roadmap and some final words to conclude this session. Graphine was a middleware company, so this is the, the R&D team of Graphine. We were a university spin-off that spun out of the founding team's research. So myself here in the center in my white shirt, and Bart and Charles on the left, uh, the founding team. And so we were working on the, at the Ghent University on streaming technology, texture creation tools, um, compression formats, and decided to commercialize the technology as a middleware for the gaming industry. That was called Granite SDK, our middleware. And we got acquired in March 2019, and we are now part of Unity Graphics R&D and we are the team focused on anything texture related and anything graphics streaming related. Granite SDK is not new, so we, it was a middleware that was used for video games, virtual reality, augmented reality, high-end video games, so a bunch of titles got shipped and larger teams work with this, so um, the uh, editor side of the Unity integration got rewritten, so the, uh, the workflow is much better, but the runtime is still more or less the same, and so very robust, already tested, quite mature and stable. And so high resolution textures, if you try to use this in your project, you might run into a bunch of issues. And so the main issue is typically memory usage. So if we look at a PBR material that has three 4K textures, then that requires 50 megabytes of video memory. That means for a one gigabyte texture budget, we can only have 21 unique 4K PBR materials. For some games, this might be enough, or you could even use lower resolution, but in many cases you want more, so you want to have more unique materials. And if you use or render for higher resolution screens, then definitely you need high resolution textures, so more texels, because you need something, some detail to, to sample or to show on each screen pixel. Or you might have already high resolution assets, like photogrammetry scanned assets, or you're coming from a, another industry where you generated these high resolution assets and you want to bring them into a real-time engine, so into Unity. But yeah, you might run out of memory, so you might have on your high-end development machine more video memory, but maybe your target users don't have more memory, so you need a solution for that, and that solution is texture streaming. Now, streaming virtual texturing is a texture streaming solution. It's a fine-grained, quite advanced solution. And in virtual texturing, what we're going to do is we're going to take the texture data the UV space and we're going to divide that into very small tiles that are typically 128 by 128 texels. And we're going to divide the entire MIP stack and then we are going to stream only those tiles that are actually sampled or visible. So that means we don't need to keep an entire MIP map into memory. We can have only sub areas of MIP maps in memory and so that's why it's all sometimes called sparse textures because they're not entirely in memory and the name virtual texturing comes from virtual memory where also not all the like for, from the programmer's perspective everything is in memory but in reality some parts are in physical memory and some are not so this is the same thing here so we tile it all up and we only stream what is actually visible now because we're not storing entire textures we need a different sampling approach and in our system we have a tile cache texture which is a texture array and we're going to store these tiles in let's say random order in that cache and then we need a way to actually sample those tiles so we need to find them in the cache and for that we have an indirection texture 
And so with the virtual UV, we sample the indirection texture and then, then that contains the information to find the tile in the cache so we can actually sample it. So that means that a texture sample, a VT texture sample, is more expensive than a regular texture sample because we first need to sample the indirection texture, do some calculations, then sample the cache. And we're doing this in the shader, so we're, we're using what we call software virtual texturing. We're not using hardware graphics API acceleration like tiled resources or partially resident textures because the software implementation is, is fast and more flexible and uh, more broadly applicable. So if we have this kind of setup, then we still need to know which of these tiles we need to stream. We call this residency management. And this is done automatically in the background in, at runtime based on the main camera. So we bind an additional render target that renders and we render out the tile IDs to this additional render target. And then we copy back this buffer to the CPU that gets processed. And so this always lags a few frames behind because we actually know at the time of rendering which tiles we need. We never stall the render pipeline. So we actually, if the tile is not in memory, we just sample from a tile from a lower resolution mipmap. And if you look at our sampling here, so our indirection texture, if the tile is not there, the indirection texture entry will just point to another tile from a higher MIP, so a low, low resolution MIP that is covering that same UV space. So we have an automatic fallback. We never need to stall the render pipeline. And perhaps for some frames, then for those pixels, the quality will be a little bit less. So this is all done automatically. But you can add additional requests. So we have a C Sharp API where you can request specific areas of MIPS of textures. And this is very helpful for prefetching. So sometimes you know in advance that some things will be will be needed if you have a camera warp or camera cut or something like that. Uh, or you just want to keep some low res data always in memory to avoid any potential streaming artifacts. So you can build this on top of our C-Sharp API. And the thing to know is that there, there is no direct management. So every frame you keep telling the system, hey, I think this is important, this is what I want in the cache, and the system will try to do its best, but there, there are no guarantees. It's a best effort thing, there might not be enough memory or there might be contention. So it, it will do its best, but you cannot count on things to be immediately in, uh, in memory, and it depends on your, your, the speed of your disk and some, some other variables. And so here is kind of a, an overview of the flow. So every frame we render to our tile ID render target, we copy this back. This gets processed by some code, let's call it the cache manager, that then translates this into read requests to the disk. From the disk we read pages, which are larger than tiles for, for efficient throughput. And then these pages get stored in a CPU cache that you can configure, and out of that CPU cache we uh, extract tiles that are then copied to the GPU cache and that uh, once they are there can actually be used for rendering. So here you see a scene set up with, with virtual texturing. You see these cubes, they each have a 3, 3K, 3, 4K textures. And so once the camera starts moving, every frame, some tiles, some new tiles become visible. And so you can see not the entire textures, the entire map maps need to be loaded of those cubes, only certain areas of those cubes are visible and here you can see our debug view that shows the, the tiles and the color of the tile borders represent the map map from where the tile originates and so you can see if the camera speeds up every frame more of these tiles are visible and here I flush the cache if I toggle the debug view and so you can see it because the camera is moving it takes some time to catch up but Everything was removed from the cache and reloaded. And so this is the, the, the magic of streaming virtual texturing that these, in, these textures don't need to be entirely loaded. Only the parts that were facing the camera that were actually visible by the camera need to be loaded. And that's the main advantage compared to MIP map streaming. So MIP, in MIP map streaming, you're going to load entire MIP maps. So both are good for large open worlds. They allow you to use more data in your scene than you have memory. But streaming virtual texturing shines if you have dense 
scenes or if you have really high resolution textures. And so we can explain it with this slide where on the left side we have a camera that sees four cubes. Let's, let's assume they each have one 4K texture. So these four cubes are close to the camera. These 4Ks need to be loaded. And so 4Ks, four 4K textures are in memory. If you look at the right side with streaming virtual texturing, we could have eight of these objects and only the parts of these objects that are actually visible need to be loaded in memory. So we can have denser scenes with more objects close to the camera um, and even then use less memory than with mid-map streaming. Now, streaming virtual texturing is obviously great, but it's not the answer for every problem. So it is a texture optimization technique, but it comes at the expense of performance. As I mentioned before, you have the VT sampling, there's some additional components running, uh, analyzation, etc. So there are CPU cycles and GPU cycles that are spent on running the system. So apply it wisely. Now, when do you not use streaming virtual texturing? Well, obviously, if you don't have high resolution textures, it does not make sense. So if you only have textures that are lower than 1K, perhaps 1K, then it might not make sense for your use case. Also, you need to have some performance budget, some frame budget. So it will take one to three MS per frame running this system. So you need to have a budget for that. And if you are already, if your frame rate is already too low, then this might not be the memory optimization technique that you need. Also, you need to have some texture memory budget, uh, let's say 250 megabytes. You, if you have only a few textures, it might actually increase memory usage if you apply streaming virtual texturing. We have a fixed size cache that is relatively independent of the content you have in your, in your scene. It depends more on your screen resolution. So there's like a, a minimum amount of, of texture budget you need. So it, it's not always ideal to reduce memory usage. That's the bottom line here. You need to have some memory that you can allocate on, uh, on textures and texture streaming. And then also, if only a very small subset of textures qualifies to use with streaming VT, so if only a few of these textures would be sometimes in view that use VT, you might not want to pay the cost of running streaming VT every frame uh, and in your project so it, it might not make sense so the thing you can do is then reduce the amount of textures downscale them uh, or mip, use mipmap streaming now which textures do you use streaming on well if they are always visible throughout the entire game or, or scene then you don't need to apply streaming it's not it doesn't make sense it will always be in memory if they are low resolution or an entire mipmap is always visible, then use mipmap streaming. And then if they are really high resolution, if they are not always visible and not entirely visible, so for example, a camera face, uh, a character facing the camera, its back its backside is not visible, the character will be not always seen in view. So this, these are great candidates. And only if it's only sampled once in your shader because if you sample a texture let's say a noise texture many times in your shader then for each vt sample you're paying a certain cost so then it might not make sense to use vt for that texture so these are some general rules there are always exceptions um, but to keep this in uh, in mind now how do you set up streaming virtual texturing in your project well an important the, the main thing here is that you need to add a node to your shader graph and you need to replace your texture samples with VT samples. And the thing here that will be strange is that a virtual texture property has something new which we call layers. And these layers are basically textures. They will be exposed in the material uh, editor or material inspector as textures. But this is a way, a performance optimization technique in, in VT and a way to minimize the cost of your VT sample, where if you have one 
VT property with three layers that will be less expensive than three VT properties with one layer. And the thing to know is, so we have our VT sample. And so for every VT property, for every VT sample, we sample the interaction texture once, and then we sample from the cache once per layer. If you have independent VT samples, then you will have independent interaction texture samples. So you, instead of having only one interaction texture sample and three VT, cache samples, you will have three interaction texture samples and three cache samples. Um, so it's something to keep in, in mind. And if something is not set up right in the material, then you will get a VT error material. You see here on the right, uh, instead of like a, a nicely rendered material with, um, in this case, the tiling debug view on. So if we jump into an existing project and we want to see how we convert it, then, well, first we need to make sure VT is on in the player settings. It is a project-wide setting, so it's not toggleable per player. And so here you can see it's already set up. The, um, the cubes surrounding this one already have VT, and this one doesn't because the debug view is not shown on it. And so we see we have two texture samples, and we need to convert those to one VT sample. So if we want to upgrade this material, we need to use the same references. So automatically all the materials will, all the textures that are assigned will be kept. So here we add a VT property, we add a VT sample for that. Uh, the default is that it has two layers, which is ideal here. We could add up to four layers. And so the first one will be our base color map and the second one will be our normal map. So we continue updating the shader graph, connect it to the rest of the graph. And now we can see in the main preview that we have our VT debug material. And that, that's because there are no textures assigned to, the, to all the layers. So right now, this is kind of a hard requirement. We want to get rid of that. But you need to assign textures to each layer, or the material will not render correctly. So here now we signed two textures, one to each layer, and now we can see everything rendering nicely and we still have our debug view on. And now we can see that this cube is now rendered with a VT enabled material. Now, if you want to optimize it, we can toggle VT texture only on the texture importer of each of these textures. And then we'll only store this texture as a tiled virtual texture. Otherwise, we'll also have a conventional texture in our game build, and that allows you to use this texture still on non-VT properties as well. Um, but that can double the amount of your, your build size if you store the textures twice in, uh, in different formats. So if you are 100% sure that your textures won't be sampled in um, regular texture samples, then toggle this on. And you could see that the texture inspector then also used VT because there is no classic texture to be sampling from. Now, in a texture streaming system, cache management is really important. How do you set your cache and how large do you set your cache? And here again, there's something a bit unconventional. We have a cache per texture format. And that is because our cache is nothing more than a texture array. And so we just need to allocate this, this set the size of each texture array where we can stream tiles into. So you can figure this per format. That doesn't mean that they will be created. They will only be created once the material is rendered with that is using that format, a, a streaming for, um, a material that is using streaming virtual texturing, obviously. And so then these caches will be created and we want to have an optimal size for each cache and well, the optimal size is basically the minimum size that still gives you the best quality and you could set it higher you could set it larger and then we can cache more data but it won't impact the quality one thing to note is that yeah destroying and creating these large texture arrays 
it can take some time, so it's a bit expensive. Don't do this during regular gameplay, uh, or you might have long frames and, and some stutter. Do this uh, during some specific quality setting um, time. Now, in our system, you can set a certain cache size, and perhaps that size is too small for what the system would want to have in memory. And then we'll actually monitor the cache and monitor if the cache is not overused to protect it against cache trashing. So once a cache is, once the current frame requires more tiles in memory than two thirds of a cache, then we will set the mipmap bias and this will be set automatically. And so the bias will increase, which means we will sample from higher MIPS which means less tiles will be requested and the texture quality will be reduced. And so we increase the bias to guarantee that we use only a maximum of two thirds of the cache for this current frame. Now, if you set the cache low, lower than the optimal size, obviously this will re result in lower quality. And uh, this is something to keep in, in mind. Now, it's not always straightforward what size you best use or what is the optimal size. So we have our VT profiler that can guide you. And so this profiler shows you how many tiles that are in view currently, how uh, many that are missing from the cache, how many data that will be read and is read from disk. And it also shows you which caches are created at that time for which texture format and how much they are used we call it cache demand so that's what what we what the current frame would require of that cache so here we see a usage of 23 percent which is great um, if once the usage would be 66 percent the mid bias would kick in and we would see here a mid bias that is greater than zero which means that actually the current frame thrice requires more cache than you have actually allocated so if you want to find the optimal cache size then you might want to do a player capture and log all these cache demands and the maximum of these and that gives you a good indication of how much um, how large this cache needs to be for the optimal size now currently streaming virtual texturing is only available for the hdrp render pipeline the bulk of the feature of the code lives in core unity but it needs some customization of um, an srp so we have in shader graph the additional nodes and we need to buy into additional render target so right now it's hdrp only and there's still a number of limitations that we want to uh, that we want to remove and so hdrp only means also it's only available for the platforms that hdrp is available so PC, high-end consoles. Now, on our roadmap, the most important thing for streaming VT is to add asset bundle support, because right now, if a material is using VT, if you put that material in an asset bundle, you won't have any texture data. So you cannot store these materials in an asset bundle, and this is something we would like to support, and then potentially also, or definitely also store the tiled texture data in the asset bundle together with the VT material. This is something we're working on right now. It's quite important for some use cases. And then also support for the universal render pipeline. This is definitely really important and we want to bring streaming virtual texturing to this pipeline as well. And probably in a later phase to all the different platforms that URP supports and for which streaming VT makes sense because again it's it does require some cycles it's it's not free so on very low end platforms we won't support streaming virtual texturing so that brings us to the end of this presentation we already have a public sample project that you can try out you can download it we posted it on our forum where we are also collecting uh, feedback so please try it out and tell us what you think there are already a page or pages in the online unity manual that you can look for more information and we will um, we have a survey that we would be very grateful if you could fill it in so we can collect more um, information on 
your uses of streaming virtual texturing and how we can best help you. All right, thank you for attending this Unite session on streaming virtual texturing. I hope you've learned a lot to help build your Unity skills and advance your projects. And feel free to provide us with uh, any feedback you might have. Finally, be sure to check out our Unite Now page for other sessions that are sure to inform and inspire you.